now it's uh, up to me. I yield myself 10 minutes uh, for my uh, questions and comments. And first of all, once again, Dr. Swagel, thanks so much for uh, being here and for your responsiveness and the information. One thing that I think may be important to have as a part of the record uh, is for you to briefly explain what this forecast, mm -hmm. what this outlook is used for, why it's important. And, and there's also, I, I kind of inferred a sense that some members, particularly on the Republican side, think that you work for Democrats uh, because there, there was a, some pronouns and maybe the pronouns were used accidentally. But, um, but talking ju just in general about this process and why it's so important and what its, what its purpose is. No, thank you. Um, so we, we serve the Congress. We work for the you know for both chambers and uh, and, and both sides. So we're, we're nonpartisan, um, and we we work for, through the budget committees and, and for the chairs and ranking members of committees of jurisdiction. The baseline update provide once the budget committees adopt adopt the work as a new baseline provides a foundation for policymakers to look at the impact of, um, of fiscal policy, whether on spending or on, um, uh, on revenue. So th that's why we do it the way we do it. We, we try to look ahead under current law as best we can so that you have the foundation on which to evaluate fiscal policy. And I know you constantly mention, uh, give disclaimers about mm -hmm. uh, you know, the uncertainty of these projections. Mm -hmm. I remember several years ago when uh, uh, Tim Geithner was Secretary of the Treasury and appeared before the committee. And um, I think uh, uh, Paul Ryan was chairman at that point. And I asked, he was showing all these charts going out to 19, uh, 2075 and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and I asked the secretary at that point, how reliable, given the pace of change in the world and all the, the, the dynamics that, that, that are involved in a world economy, how reliable do you think projections going out 30, 40, 50 years are? And he said to me, I don't think projections going out more than five years are reliable. And so I, I just want, when we're, when we're talking about these 10 years, I know you have to do it, uh, mm -hmm. but would you agree that, that uh, there's a great variation in the possibilities related relative to your projections at this point? No, absolutely. And as you said, as Secretary Geithner said, the difficulty, it, you know, it, it grows. Um, you know, uh, as we go out over time. Um, and and we, we, we understand that, we acknowledge that. I mean, even, you know, nominal dollars comparing a dollar in year 10 against a dollar in year one, right? We do it because that's useful to the Congress. But of course, policymakers understand that, you know, 10 years from now is different than, than this year. Um, you know, the other thing we do, we do also is we keep the baseline, you know, the baseline constant um, just so that you have a constant benchmark that, you know, as I, I said before, right, we know our inflation forecast is, is too low, right? I and mean, there's, right, we locked it in the beginning of March, subsequent events showed it was, it was higher. We're still going to keep the baseline, the economic projection constant, so that there's a, a this is a, a consistent benchmark to evaluate all proposals, you know, both sides, both chambers. That's, and so that's the key to what we do is to, have, to be consistent so that you know you and your, your colleagues can um, can evaluate the, the merits or not of legislation. Thank you. I want to talk about inflation for a little bit because I, I think you know we hear these numbers eight point three percent. The most recent one, your projections uh, for this year a little bit lower than that. Um, and the, the comment made, you know, it's a five thousand dollar tax increase for for the average family. Well, it really depends on what the average family does and how it's. Uh, what it's composed of. I mean, the, the impact of inflation on a family of six or eight is a lot different than the impact on a family of two. Food prices are different. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, uh, if you're going to, at one point, I know that it was estimated that a third of the inflation rate was due to the price of used cars, mm -hmm. uh, the, the growth. Well, if you're not buying a car, that portion of the inflation rate doesn't affect you. Uh, so it's really kind of... Um, it's individual circumstances that are going to determine the impact of increased prices on everyone. Now, we know everybody eats and food prices are up and we, we have to respond to these as we can, but uh, we generalize because that's what we do. But one of the questions that, you know, I, I know, for instance, you know, everybody's saying, well, the price of eggs are gone up. Well, they had to kill 5 million hens mm -hmm. because of the avian flu. That's not anything had to do with anybody's policy, right? That was an, an unfortunate 
uh, act of nature that met, resulted in the price of eggs. When the pandemic started, lumber manufacturers start, stopped uh, producing lumber because they thought there wouldn't be a demand for it. Well, it turns out there was a huge demand for it. They weren't supplying it. The price of lumber went up five or six times. Uh, now it's come back down to about a third of its, its high, of its highest level. But all of these components make it really difficult to act, not just to figure out what happened uh, to cause the inflation, but also to deal with it. Uh, because a lot of it's the, the actual marketplace and decisions that producers made, uh, we, the, the, the shipment of computer chips and mm -hmm. so forth impacted a lot. But Republicans want to say that the, the American Rescue Plan was largely responsible for this. And my question is, have you done any analysis of to what extent the American Rescue Plan contributed to inflation? You, you said it was a factor, mm -hmm. and, uh, but have you done any analysis of to what extent it was a factor? Uh, no, so we, we haven't, and we haven't tried to parcel that out be, you know, between the mix of, of demand, you know, the strong demand and strong, um, you know, the, the not strong, the opposite of strong, the supply impediments. And it's, it's both. And that's one of the challenges that there's so many things going on, changes in the, the economy and the labor market, um, you know, from health and scientific reasons with the virus. Um, and we just, we have not disentangled that, uh, you know, at some point in the future, people will go back and, and disentangle that. And um, right. Well, some have. I mean, I think Moody's analytics said it was about a, a half a percent or a third of a percent of the of the total of inflation. Uh, the Fed in San Francisco came up with a similar number. I think Goldman Sachs came up with less than one percent. Um, and, you know, Larry Summers predicted that he's now taking credit for having predicted this inflation rate based on the American Rescue Plan. But he basically said, this, a third, there was a third possibility it would be significant inflation, a third that it would be moderate, and a third it would be not. So he tried to cover his bases totally at the time, and now he's mm -hmm. taking credit for it. Uh, but there are not a lot of economists who are saying that, that it's the lion's share of, of the inflation that we're, we're seeing now. Um, and you know, what people tend to, to forget is that about 25% of the uh, American Rescue Plan was essentially a tax cut. It was fourteen hundred dollar checks to almost every every citizen in the in the country. Uh, in every congressional district, on average, there was sent by the federal government nine hundred million dollars of disposable income. And I think we can argue over whether that was justified or not, or whether it uh, it was uh, needed or not. But I don't think many of the millions, hundreds of millions of Americans who got that $1,400 check sent it back. They were very grateful for it. And, and, and I think you can make a strong case that uh, that had a large, uh, played a large role in actually helping the economy recover, saving businesses all over the country and saving, uh, saving, saving lives. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that when, and I, I'll ask you for this, we talk about deficits, and obviously uh, we can argue about how bad they are, what we need to do to resolve them, uh, what we, if, whether we do. But by and large, isn't it true that when the government uh, runs a deficit that the American people run a surplus? Oh, I see. Um, oh, I mean, right, the, go the government is running the deficits, and the, the Funds are going somewhere. So, in some of the air, the American Rescue Plan Act was an illustration of that. That that um, or that that contributed to a wider deficit, and that was used for a variety of purposes: um, the rebate checks to American families, um, uh, virus, you know, uh, combating the virus, unemployment insurance, and uh, aid for state, state and local governments. Right. So, in some of that's absolutely the money is um, you know is, is recycled is a good term here. You know, used throughout the economy. When the government runs a surplus, it's taking money out of the economy and mm -hmm. therefore from people. When it runs a deficit, it is putting money into the economy and into people's pockets. And the question is, uh, you know, what impact, what other impacts does that have? And that's obviously what we're uh, trying to discuss here. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to use the last 20 seconds, except once again, to thank you for being here today. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your responses today. And we look forward to hearing from you again in the not, to, not so distant future. Uh, and unless there's any further business, 
This hearing is adjourned.